Okay, welcome back to You're Better Than That, a podcast hosted by me, Hannah Miller. It's great to have everyone back with us. So let's get going into today's episode, which is a nod to International Book Day, World Book Day, not International, (laughs) World Book Day. And you know, when I was a teacher, World Book Day was always quite a thing and you'd dress up and it would be quite a thing for parents as well because they'd be frantically, what have I dressed up as? So I, one of my memorable outfits was going as thing one and thing two with another of my teacher friends. So big, big wigs and, you know, big red t-shirts and red nose. Um, I've had the boys as characters from um, uh, the BFG. Um, uh, What else have they been? other I think other role doll things they've been hobbit things and all sorts of things but I was very much in a group of friends where we would trade costumes I am not the I'm going to make the most amazing costume we would trade and be like I've used this one you try this one this year and we would swap them around so I'm quite relieved that my boys are older and I don't have any world book day costumes but I love a good read But first question before we, what we're going to do in this episode is talk about a few books I've read in the last year and what I think of them and what we can learn from them. But I've got a question. Do you think that using audio books, using Audible counts as reading? Okay. I know you use audio books. I've got to be careful. I mean, these are actual books that I've got sat here, but I do also use Audible. I would say no. I think sitting down and opening a book is reading audiobook is listening Mm, I think that's possibly fair I think it means you kind of say you've read the book in the sense that you've listened to the book and you know the content but it's not the same activity as it is reading so you're getting the content in and you're learning I love an audiobook because it means that you can read a book on the hoof a little bit more at the moment I'm listening to one when I go to sleep and I I have like 10 minutes on as I go to sleep I also an on-the-go mom I am an on-the-go mom no and I love a multitask and sometimes that's to my own detriment but I love the fact that I can be getting something done and listening to a bit of a book that I otherwise probably wouldn't make the time to listen to one of my favorite audio books of late because these are real books here um, was Rory Stewart's book Politics on the Edge so I loved that as an audio book and I would argue that some books are better read listen to than read and that's one of them because he reads it and he does brilliant accents for everybody so if you want a good audio book I think that's possibly better listen to than just read so there you go but I thought today we could talk about a few books that I would recommend to people and what we can learn for ourselves so a few life lessons from a good book some of them are novels and some of them are real life stories is that all right excellent happy with the sound (laughs) Great. <laughs> okay, the first one is Pride and Prejudice, which is obviously not a new release. In fact, it was written in like the 1800s. So this book I have read before. And I've come back to it because a friend of Noah, my eldest, said that she pretty much reads it every year. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I haven't read it for a long time. I'm going to read it again. And the reason I'm recommending this book to people is some, some people may have never... Have you ever read it? No. So it's one of those books that you kind of feel like you've read because everyone talks about it and there's TV shows and there's films. Yeah, you study it at school maybe, but it is so worth a read. It is funny. It is gently feminist. It is romantic. It has a good ending. And what I've noticed this time is that she really understands personality. And so as somebody who works as a personality coach, and we use Clifton Strengths, Strengths Finder for the people who are listening, as I was think, reading this book this time, I was thinking, oh my goodness me, you can see the Clifton strengths of the characters. So I'm just going to say what my thoughts are real quick on that, because um, if you know the book, you'll know what I'm saying. So Mr. Bingley is definitely woo, adaptability, activator, positivity, empathy, all of that kind of stuff, includer. He is like so warm, so friendly But his dark side is that he's a bit too led by impulse or by what other people think. So you can also see like the dark side of those strengths. Mm. Then you've got Jane, Jane Bennett. And Jane Bennett is definitely harmony, 
and connectedness. So she can kind of see the big picture. She thinks things will turn out as they should. She's so kind about everybody. She looks for the good in everyone to her detriment. So sometimes she doesn't say what she feels because of the fact that she wants peace and she wants everyone to be okay. So again, you can see her beautiful personality, but you can see where it, it gets her gets in her way. Then you've got Elizabeth, who's our protagonist of the book. And I think she's got strategic belief, communication, uh, relater maybe. And she's quite opinionated, quickly so. She's quick. She's quick-witted. Maybe positivity as well in there. And Mr. Bingley definitely has positivity too. And yet again, you can see that sometimes she makes her mind up and then she's closed off. And it takes quite a bit for her to see a different perspective. Mm. She's strong, strong willed, strong opinions, maybe a little bit of self assurance as well. And then we've got Mr. Darcy. And I don't want to spoil it for you, though, because if you don't know this story, I don't want to say everything. But Mr. Darcy is your classic relator, deliberative, self assurance, maybe a bit of command, maybe a bit of intellection. He's thought through, he's careful, responsibility. Oh my gosh, I forgot that one, definitely responsibility. And his challenge is that he's got so much depth, but he can be so misunderstood. And he doesn't always say what he needs to say. He holds back. He's a bit proud sometimes, a bit self-sufficient. And so I guess I was just thinking that I've never really thought about this with a book before, but you can see that these like traits of personality, if you've got a great author in front of you, they're really obvious and you can start to connect them to your own strengths. And I could relate them to the ones that I have and, and the ones that I don't have. Really? Yeah, it's really good. What, um, top life lessons have you learned? From, from this book. The main thing is that it is really easy to make an opinion of somebody based on somebody else's opinion. Mm. And you need to remember that you are only getting somebody's version of events. Mm -hmm. And so it's very easy to be um, prejudiced about somebody based on somebody else's experience. And also that we can be proud and not say what we need to say. I think that's the other life lesson from this book. I just want to add something or ask something. So you've said um, don't kind of treat people based on your experience on the, of them, not on other people. But what if uh, the person's opinion is someone that you trust? A family member, maybe your spouse. Like, where, where's the line? Yeah. Well, that's definitely more important. So in the book, what happens is that there are hearsay and conversations about someone added to the fact that this person is also maybe quite a private person. And so reasonably trusted individuals but not right close in the center or giving opinion and I think your point there's a really good one because actually if somebody's in your more inner trusted circle their opinion really does matter but I still think there's something about remembering also that people can change and grow and also somebody's previous experience of them might not also be who they are now. And gosh, if people's opinions of me when I was younger are the only ones they have, it's not a full opinion about who I am right now. So I think there's a generosity of um, benefit of the doubt that's still a really great idea. But also you can protect yourself if people that know people well are giving you wise advice for sure. So Good. So shall we move on to something slightly more modern? <laughs> Brilliant, timeless book. But this one, I think, is going to be a future classic. And it's called Hello, Beautiful by Anne Napolitano. I've just lent this to my friend who read it in a sitting and gave it back and was like, oh, my goodness, I love this book. I didn't want it to be over. And I'm, I love it when you recommend something and people love it. So this book is also about so there's five sisters in Pride and Prejudice and there's four sisters in Hello, Beautiful. So there's a big sisterhood theme. You and me both have sister. Yeah, we both do. We love our sisters. They are uh, our big sisters as well. We're the little sister. And there's a lot in this book that looks at the dynamic of siblings and sisterhood, which is so beautiful. If you've ever read Little Women, if you're listening to this and you've read Little Women, it's nothing like it in the sense that it's not trying to be little women but it's got that sisterhood as a, a core aspect of the book and they actually refer to little women in the book because they all love the book so this is about four sisters and essentially it looks at loss it looks at our life it looks at redemption 
it looks at how significant moments in our life can really alter the path of our life and how we see ourselves. It's got very different characters in it. It's beautiful. It's easy to read. Um, and it covers some quite complex things, really, like the complexity of family. Mm. What's interesting in this book is they are a really close family and they have so many lovely things about their bond with one another, which is so beautiful, but it isn't perfect. And there are times when their relationship with each other is quite dysfunctional. So it kind of shows that it can be both and that really good, close, love, loving family relationships can still have difficulty. There's a frustrating element in the book around grudges and forgiveness. I've got to be honest, I found that frustrating. Things that happen within the book and people making decisions to then say, that's it, I'm never going back. Um, and you can see how the story unfolds, how much loss those people have, because they just say, you have let me down, and that's it, you know, a, a dead wood to me kind of conversation. And the pain throughout the book from people making those black and white decisions and moving on is so, so sad. And I think the other thing is just this idea of how trauma can affect us. And that really made me reflect on me as well. And as you're reading the book, you realize that these individuals are shaped by their experiences for the good and the not so good. And it really impacts the way they deal with pain and really how they see themselves until they see a new way of seeing themselves. And it reminds us about the need to be authentic, uh, to, to look for real proper connection with people and to, to be the person that we are made to be. So it's a novel. It's not, you know, it's not a true story, but there's so many elements in it that just relate to regular people, regular families, regular loving relationships and the dynamics of being so deeply entwined with a sibling and yet the pain that can come when something doesn't turn out how you think it might. Um, it's, it is a beautiful, beautiful book. Love that. Great reflection. Yeah. yeah. And and I guess I think what it made me think about was where am I um where am I holding on to a bit of a grudge? Even if I think I've forgiven and we're not in that kind of, you know, dead to me kind of space, but could I be holding on to resentment? Which is shaping the way I'm interacting with that person. And for me that's probably much more likely than it being what does that look like if you I mean, if you think you've forgiven someone yeah. but then you're still holding on to that? Yeah, I think for me, when I'm in that space, if I've forgiven someone and it's not kind of top tier awful and we're in the we're forgiven, I might go back into um, spaces with that person where I am not as fully open and generous with them as I previously have been or wrongly holding them to a... Um, a lower expectation that's maybe not fair or perhaps I'm just not willing to and perhaps in some ways that's a good thing I'm protecting myself I'm protecting my heart but in other ways it's it's not going to give your friendship or your relationship a chance to really repair if you're holding on to a bit of of grudge and distance you've got to kind of go back to a safe um a safe all in where possible and obviously there are loads of situations where forgiveness does mean the end of a relationship and and that's really true but some of the examples in the book you think this is redeemable there are loads of things that are redeemable let it be redeemed and you know get your life back on track which actually reflects on um the whole idea of regret which i know we're going to talk about in a separate episode together and it also is a really good reminder to think about who you cherish and who you love and how open and generous are you being with those people mm -hmm. and the sister bit's so good like the the just the love of the sisters and the the there's something about your sister isn't there Zoe that as in a sister that they just have a shared experience that means you just get each other in a way that even with distance and time you can just slot back in if you're fortunate to have a close relationship yeah there's almost like this you're in sync and I I feel that with my sister absolutely and they play on that beautifully in the book as well but it is interesting that that doesn't mean they don't hurt each other either I'm sure you've had your moments <laughs> we've had our moments for sure me and my sister so that's a brilliant book shall I move on yeah. okay the next one is oh my goodness oh my word it's called I thought that was the name of the book <laughs> <laughs> it should be called oh my goodness oh my word it's called I am I am I am mm -hmm. by Maggie 
O'Farrell. I've read a few of her books. She's great. But this is different because this is, okay, we're moving into a memoir. So this is a true story. And it's 17 near brushes with death. Yeah. I read this book on the sofa one afternoon and didn't get up till I finished it. It, The whole thing. I just didn't move until I'd read it. It is a deep breath kind of book. And so what happens in the book is that she tells the story of her life through 17 near misses with death. And they're not told in chronological order. So you are hearing the unfolding of her life. It starts in 1990, then it goes back to 1988, back to 1977. Then we go forward to the 2000s. So we're picking up pieces of her life, but each of them are moments where there is a a brush with death. 17 of those. I mean, we had a conversation about this. I was away with friends a couple of weekends ago and we were like, have we had this many brushes with death? (laughs) And I don't think that I've had anywhere near that many brushes with death in my life, but she's had quite a few. And so each chapter is named after a different part of her body. It's called neck, abdomen, lungs, head, and so on. So because that's the area of her body that was under threat. She's she's an author, so she's incredibly um, skilled at storytelling. But all I kind of want to say about this book is that your breath is taken away with some of the near misses she has and the way her life could have looked differently. And I think that's an interesting topic to think about. Where have I come close to my life looking very different? And I think on top of that, rather than you feeling like, oh my goodness, I'm just about to die at any moment, it doesn't really leave you feeling like that. It leaves you more thinking, I want to live more fearlessly. I want to embrace the fact that life is interrupted. Life doesn't look how we think. And courage, resilience, gratitude for life and fully embracing the life you have is is throughout this book, even though it's told through some of the most horrific um, experiences that somebody can go through. Quite chilling, some of them. And, And also real these are real life they're, they aren't the things that are completely beyond the realms of, of reality and I think the question here is how do we really embrace life fully how do we how do we without having to have 17 near brushes with death uh, how do we choose to like go all in with life so that we don't need those moments to wake us up and say actually um, am I just sleepwalking through the way life is yeah. at the moment I'd love to ask you this is kind of I'm just using this as my own personal my own personal time um where's the balance between going after something um if someone like really wants to do something for example write a book they really want to write a book what's the balance between just going for it and timing and sometimes stuff needs time and you need to wait like how do you navigate the in-between and I've been thinking about that actually because so many things that occur in our life take place because of something that shifts the needle. So either a life circumstance, like like for example, you find yourself being made redundant or circumstances squeeze you towards something new, you become unwell or somebody in your family becomes unwell. And so you reassess the way life looks. And I guess in response to what you're saying, what I'm reflecting on is, can we manufacture that sense of um, fearless living and gratitude when we haven't had that that impetus of our own because this isn't my life this is Maggie's life and can I what can I take from this when it's not my moment and I think when there's something we really want to go after there are still seasons for when we can do that and times where we have to put that dream or that hope in a drawer because we've got to wait till it's the right moment um, and we've got to take it back out when the, the the timing is right and I am a believer in the idea of like timing and seasons for things So I think there's a difference between not doing something because of fear and not doing something because the time's not right. And that's the question to ask yourself. Am I staying as I am and doing the the, the thing that I do because I haven't got the courage or there's a fear that's holding me back? Or am I staying as things are because actually right now that is the right thing to do? And it's the wisdom to know the difference, I reckon. And I think we know. I think if we think it's fear... 
Um, I think we know when that's the reason and we just need to talk to somebody about that and and say, I'm actually petrified. I think this is what I should do. We've actually got somebody that I know that you know as well who is exploring um, the political sphere as a, as a place of work. And she knows that it's absolutely terrifying for her to even begin to think about that. But she's making baby steps towards what that might be in her life and she's being courageous. And the biggest, most courageous thing was to tell a few people will you help me with this and will you support me as I do it so whatever your courageous thing looks like I think a few trusted people to just know and cheer you on even if in a year there's very small progress they're there to cheer you on is is a, a sidebar but I think really important and if you can read this book read it and and sit there and go oh my word as you read it what's next oh well we're sticking with the non-fiction and this book is very overwhelming. So where I thought that was quite overwhelming, this book is really overwhelming in a good way and in a complete whole way. Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson. This is also a film uh, with Michael B. Jordan and playing Brian Stevenson. And so this is the story of Brian Stevenson's work. I've actually heard Brian Stevenson speak, um, which is why I then went to, on to read the book. He was speaking at a leadership conference at the Albert Hall a few years ago. And when he spoke, it was simply a, a, about a 40-minute speech, like a, an oratory. Um, and when he finished, the whole place gave him a standing ovation for about five minutes it was. And in fact, this is like a little aside, but I noticed as we were, as he started to speak, Marcus Mumford and Kerry Mulligan walked in and, and listened to him. And I was like doing this whole like star spotting. <laughs> they watched and they were part of the, you know, the standing ovation and they left and they weren't there for the whole thing. But um, they obviously had come to hear him. It was awe inspiring. It was challenging. It was unsettling. And it was hope filling as well so I then th thought I'm going to read his book in fact Sam bought it for me as a present and so Just Mercy is the story of his life as this um, incredibly gifted law professional who finds himself making a choice to represent people on death row for a living which was never his original intention so another interesting point here is how does a little moment in our life completely change the direction we go on and the the kind of serendipity of that so brian stevenson's on a work placement I'll, I'll share this little bit because it's brilliant i'm paraphrasing but he's on a work placement and he um he goes to visit his very first uh, inmate prisoner who is on death row and by a strange set of, set of circumstances this young man who he goes to just pay a visit to was born on exactly the same day as him. Same day, same year. They're the same age as one another. And there's something about looking at a man of the same age and stage whose life looks completely different to his own that begins to unsettle him and rattle him in a way that he can't shake. There's something about his, his knees, need for mercy that he can't shake. And so it's called Just Mercy because it's about the idea of justice and the idea of forgiveness and the idea of uh, redemption and uh, people having a way back. But he covers the, the, the fact that in the USA, they have the highest levels of incarceration in the world. He talks about the racial injustice and the likelihood of a person of, um, who is black to be more inclined to be imprisoned for what they do. And then the likelihood of ending up on death row. And the reason it's so compelling and it doesn't, it isn't as heavy as it sounds, although it is overwhelming, he writes it like a novel. So you feel like you're reading a John Grisham novel. That's the best way I can describe it. There is a key character that you become attached to and you want to find out what happens to him. I think his name is Walter. It's Walter. And you want to know, does Walter um, get off death row? So you've got this one story that's threaded through that you become attached to and it's told with pace, but you're also being presented with the fact that the world's really unfair and what can we do so the reason I say it's overwhelming is that I can't be Brian Stevenson and I can't do what he's done but if he wasn't doing what he does people's lives would literally be completely different and actually they may well have found themselves having lost their life for something they didn't even 
do. And so what I was left with was this uncomfortable feeling of what can I do? What's my part to play in bringing justice, in bringing fairness to the world around me? And actually, it's very hopeful, even though it's tragic. There is a hope that people do make a difference. I think it's easy to think we're never going to make a difference. And um, if he'd have decided that as a young man, uh, everything would have been totally different for the no n numerate people whose lives has changed. And so I was... Um, compelled again to feel what's the difference I make it might not have the level of impact of Brian Stevenson but I can have an impact and, and so can everyone who's listening and then I'm going to just really quickly mention a book I thought was really underwhelming so this was overwhelming and these have all been excellent I'm really sorry to do this but t tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow this was a global bestseller it says on the front one of the best books I've ever read uh, by John Green who's a famous author and I just was like, really? I kept thinking, is it going to get better? There's a few moments that it was better in the middle, like it was worth seeing through to the end, but I felt the characters were selfish. I felt the characters were shallow. I felt they were petty. Uh, I wasn't really rooting for any of them apart from one person. And for me, I like to root for someone. I like to feel like I, you know, I'm connected. And perhaps to be fair on the book, the hype was what did it for me. If it hadn't have been hyped as being, oh my goodness, this is the most incredible, exhilarating, emotive, exquisite, exquisite love letter of all time, I might have enjoyed it more. And so maybe there's something to be said about hype here and managing <laughs> expectation. So I, I'm, yeah, I'm not going to say loads more about it. It's a readable book, but perhaps lower expectations. And it's not just because there's a gaming element to it. I've read other books about gaming that I've enjoyed much, much more. I'm just going to mention one more book. Can I do that? Or is it too long? Yeah, but one, I'm just going to say I'm going to talk about it another time. I've got two on my pile, but I'm just going to talk about one. Sorrow and Bliss, Meg Mason. You can see that this one went on holiday with me and <laughs> many a pages fell out and I can't lend this to anybody anymore. Book or Kindle? What do you think? Book. Yeah, I do too. I love a book, but this is gets out of hand. But I think it's just there's something about the pages. I think there's something about the pages. The thing is, you can't can't lend books to people on a Kindle. But the negative is, if I go on holiday, think about the weight that I could do without if I had a Kindle. My my boys are like, Mom, you've got to get with the 21st century. <laughs> <laughs> move to Kent. I'm like no I need a book I well that's because you read multiple books on holiday like I would take one and that would be my holiday read whereas you could take six and yeah I love to take loads of books on holiday and actually there's a point in that that I've recognized just as a sidebar I read loads on holiday and then I think why don't I read anywhere near as much in normal life when I just love it and I, it is but I could prioritize it and I think at home I get a bit lazy and a book is a bit more of a commitment than social media, isn't it? You have to work a little bit harder. And I'm really trying with that. I'm making a shift and I'm doing better so far this year. So, Sorrow and Bliss by Meg Mason is simply very, very funny, but very, very deep. And I laughed out loud. Oh, we've just got a little... Google Cal reminder, I think. <laughs> Never mind. Let's just acknowledge the fact we all heard it. Um, even the best podcasts do this, though. I've heard it many a time on Rest is Politics. Yeah, in Rest is Politics, which is obviously one of the, the, the number one podcast in the country, I hear their phones ping all the time. So we won't worry about it. Sorrow and Bliss um, is funny, but very, very deep. And it's, uh, it covers the life of Martha and Martha's uh, marriage, which when we pick up the story, we begin to realise this isn't a spoiler. We realise that their marriage is in trouble and actually they're separated. Um, there's much more to the story than that. So it's not a major spoiler, but it's actually very, very funny in terms of her accurate reflections on herself and on others and what's interesting is so much about the way Martha interacts is very normal and average and then occasionally there's a hint that there's something more going on for Martha and so this book looks at mental health and Martha has quite a significant mental health issue which is covered so beautifully in this book and how she's operating these two levels of like everything is fine and everything is absolutely not fine at all. Again, I read this really, really quickly. 
uh, because I just wanted to know what happened to them. I cared about them. I cared about the characters. And I, again, it's another story that shows you how uh, your early experiences and the, some of the things that happened to you change the way you think about yourself. And that's definitely part of Martha's story. It's both funny and like quite devastating as well. Um, and I related to loads of it, even though my story is very, very different. It was a relatable book around understanding mental health. And it deals with the big stuff of life in a way that actually is quite accessible to people and covers mental health in one of the best ways I've heard and normalises some people's quite significant struggles. Martha's struggles are quite significant um, and yet it helps people understand what's going on and how actually she was able to function so well for so long as well. So I don't want to say too much about it, but how do we deal with loss and difficulty with some grace and humour is one of the things that, that kind of gets covered in this book. How do we straddle that idea that life is tough at times, but we can also find humour in even the darkest of moments? And how do we learn to accept ourselves? And, and that's a big part of Martha's story is self-acceptance. And you know what? You can go again. There's something in this story about being able to go again and go right back to the beginning. And it's not a waste to have to do that. So if you're listening to this and, and things have been difficult and you feel like there's been a lot of loss or you feel like you've given up on something, I guess I would encourage you to say that you can go again, even if you go again right from the day one. Oh, that was a bit deep. The last book, I'm just doing an honorary mention because it's Lessons in Chemistry, which is uh, by Bonnie Garmus and is also an Apple TV production. Both are brilliant. Book first, always. But what do you think? Book first. Book first. I think it makes you enjoy the film better. And I think if I watch the film or the TV show, I'm really less inclined to go back to the book. The trouble is I'm one of those annoying people that goes, it doesn't happen like that in the book. <laughs> or this is not as good as the book, which is so self-righteous. <laughs> but this is one of those situations where actually the TV show is super and really on par. I thought we could pick this up as we look at International Women's Day because this book covers loads of... Uh, being a woman in the world of work, juggling uh, how other people see you, and it acts as a really good conversation starter for that. But because it's book day, um, international, no, world book day, <laughs> world women's day and international book day, I can't seem to get the two correct. Because it's world book day, I just wanted to say this is an epic book and so worth your time and investment and makes you think, but also makes you smile. And it has a dog in it. And a dog is always a good addition to life. Um, which one would you say is your top? Oh my goodness. Top, top, top. Top novel, probably Hello Beautiful. But do you know what? I'm easily swayed by perhaps the most recent read, and that's the one I've read the most recently. So these are all out of it. There was loads of others that could have been given mentions, but um, this is like top mentions. So they're all in a high place in my life. I'd love to know, actually, podcast listeners, I'd love to know if you've read any of these and what you thought of them. So uh, get in touch with us and tell us. Podcast at hellosidekick.co. And it's just co at the end. I think herein, herein ends today's episode. Live life, embrace it fully, go read a book. <laughs>